way of uh, by saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This morning, the last Saturday in this current month of Ramadan 2024, which will be the last in the series of the Ramadan Tefsir, we have the privilege of hosting Hajiya Miriam Limu, um, a very well-known public speaker, born into the fam very famous family of Sheikh Ahmed Limu, with a career spanning over three decades. Um, Mrs. Miriam Limu is an international speaker and an adept seminar and workshop facilitator. She's the founder of Miriam Limu Marriage Academy, which is based out of the UK and Nigeria. She's currently also the head of admin and resource management at New Horizon College, MENA, Niger State, Nigeria. She brings to the table a broad range of expertise, including public speaking, counseling, mentoring, and coaching. Just to mention a few. She is passionate about human development and character building and helps her audience identify a sense of purpose and direction in life and the positive impact it exerts on both work and personal life. The topic of our conversation this morning is on upholding Islamic family values and individual and collective responsibility. Um, I would not like to waste too much of our time because it's not as if we have endless time. Uh, I think we should spend more time listening to our highly celebrated uh, speaker. And then we also create enough time for question and answer. The plan will be for us to speak for between an hour and a half, 15 minutes, preferably an hour, and then another one hour for Q and A so that we have the opportunity of benefiting immensely from our fountain of uh, knowledge and from the wide experience she's gained, counseling couples, families, helping them to uphold their Islamic values. Bismillah, Ajia. Always a pleasure, alhamdulillah. This is my third Ramadan Tafsir lecture um, out of all the four that have been conducted uh, in the past four years. So truly an honor and a pleasure to be here, Mr. Adishola. Um, thank you so much. May Allah bless you and your team and your loved ones in the best manner. And to all who have joined us, alhamdulillah, as we come to the last few days, <laughs> the end of the run, uh, we see the finishing line. May Allah accept our ibadah and grant us the full blessings of Ramadan. Now, let me share a little bit about my background. I grew up in a home where I saw so much love, so much laughter. I saw happiness. Um, my brother and I and our parents were a very close-knit team. Alhamdulillah, my parents modeled exemplary Islamic conduct. And there was a strong emphasis on being disciplined and having good manners, doing acts of service and being useful to ourselves and to others. My parents, Allah Yerhamu, were very hands-on and intentional in spite of their very busy, crazy schedule. Now, did, little did I know then that what was happening, my parents were planting seeds in us. Little did I know then that what we saw growing up would be extremely useful in how we relate with our spouses and with our two sons, my husband and I, alhamdulillah. Now, many of us get married, have children and just go with the flow, wherever it takes us. There is a quote that I love that says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there. If you don't know where you're going, then it doesn't matter where you end up, any road you take is fine. Now, if our family doesn't turn out according to the way we wanted, well, we didn't have plans in the first place. If our children don't grow up with the values we expected, we didn't have plans in the first place. For me, I reflect a lot on the state of the Ummah today, and it is something that sometimes keeps me up at night. It is deeply disturbing. And I'm not sure if the chat box is open. I would love to hear from the audience and find out what, in your opinion, is the reason why the Ummah is in the state it is in right now. What is the state of the Ummah to you? 
um, for the organizers, I'm not sure. Is the chat box open? Because I would love to get some feedback from the audience. Yes, and the chat box is open. Um, the, but um, we have the question and answer, and we also have the chat box. Um, okay. If um, for this particular response, I mean, we can actually use the key on it tab so that it can actually be very open for us to us to do it. Thank you. Okay, it would be great if we could see the chats and the responses to the questions. So again, let me ask the question: In your opinion, what is the state of the Uma right now, and how did things become like this? Can you please share in the chat box? I'll see if in the Q and A. Um, okay, so far I'm not seeing the comments, mashallah. I'll continue and I pray that we are able to actually see uh, comments from the audience. And another question I would like to ask is, why is it so hard for couples and parents to instill family values in their children? Why is it so hard? It's almost as if these days we get married, have someone that we can be intimate with, and then start popping children. Fuck that. That's it. No plans, no purpose, no true understanding as to why Allah prescribed marriage for us in the first place. But we have to understand. When we invoked Allah's name and invited him to be a witness to our union, our relationship became between me, my husband, and Allah, not just between me and my husband. Once that nikah was conducted and we invoked his name to be a witness, then our relationship is now the three of us. Marriage is a contract and a covenant between us and Allah. Parenting is a contract between us and Allah. And these two huge agreements that we undertake, we will go before Allah and answer to him for what we did and what we did not do in it. I see a, something just popped up, but it's not yet the chat box. So it is so important to Allah that he says, imagine this institution of marriage is so important to Allah that he says all our fast, all our prayers, all our zakat, the hajj put together, all our extra nawafil, visiting the sick, acts of kindness, all the extra, extra that we do to get his barakah, put that all together. And that constitutes half of our ibadah. Now imagine fulfilling your obligations to each other, to your spouse, constitutes the other half. So half of your faith goes into this institution of marriage. Why does it weigh heavily on the scales in the eyes of Allah? And guess what? That is where most of us neglect. We go out of our way to understand how to pray properly, how we stand, how we recite, we make sure we're very meticulous in pronouncing the words properly. We try our best to even understand the words. We have quotes on the tips of our tongues. We learn about all the other acts of ibadah. We visit the sick, we attend the janaizas, we do other acts of kindness and sadaqah. All that is half. The other half is fulfilling our obligations to our spouse. In other words, doing marriage right is half of our faith. Now, it's not compulsory to get married. However, it is highly encouraged in Islam. But once we do choose to go down that path, we have rights, but we also have obligations. And we must, we must fulfill our basic obligations and our the unique rights that our spouse has over us. And we will answer to Allah for that. Again, it's not compulsory to have children in Islam, but it is highly encouraged. Once we choose to have children with Allah's blessing, then they have rights over us. Our children didn't ask to be born, but we must, we must fulfill our obligations to our children because we are going to answer to Allah for what we did and didn't do in how we raised them. We owe our children shelter, love, clothing, food, healthcare, the basics. But Rasulullah said, the best gift you can give a child, which is also an obligation, is good terbiya, which is good upbringing, and a good education. We are meant to plant seeds and give them gifts of good terbiya, gifts of a holistic education, gifts beyond academic excellence, beyond creating A-class students, to nurturing and developing A-class human beings. 
Sadly, many of us are more focused and impressed with the grades that our children get at school how far they've accumulated paper qualifications, how high they have climbed up that corporate ladder, more than their character and their faith. We are more eager to show off that our children have finished the Quran or they have memorized the Quran. How much though of the Quran have they understood and are practicing? We say, oh, my child is a half is of the Quran. Uh -huh. There is a lot of blessings, yes, in reading and finishing the Quran and memorizing it. But the biggest purpose of the book is for us to be the walking Quran. It's about everything in writing being translated into our character, our actions. We are meant to be the walking Quran. Terbiya is one of the biggest rights. Imagine this. One of the biggest rights that our children have over us is that we raise them right. We give them values. We teach them about the faith. The key to Jannah may be under the parents' feet, but the key to Jahannama may be under our children's feet if we don't do right by them. So we will answer to Allah for how we lived our marriage. We will answer to Allah for how we raised our children. Now, most in the room today are professionals. We wouldn't go into any contract without reading the dotted lines, without understanding all the tiny little fine lines. Most professionals would make sure they fully, some will even ask a lawyer, please check this and tell me what I don't know. What are the hidden things written there? We would never go into it without truly understanding what we are signing up for and getting into. But we do this for marriage. We do this for parenting. We don't read the fine lines. We don't do our homework to know what are Allah's expectations of us as a spouse and of us as parents. My husband and I have been counseling couples for over 20 years. And the tragedy today is that the divorce rate is at an all time high. Now we run schools and we see more and more dysfunctional kids. Every single year it keeps getting worse. And when you dig deeper and peel the layers, you discover that it's what they're seeing in the home. Many children are growing up seeing bad fights, disrespect, shouting between the parents, putting down one parent trapped, broken, abused. Children are growing up seeing emotional abuse, psychological abuse, economic abuse, physical abuse. They see one parent dropping the ball and another parent bearing burdens that are not meant for them to bear. They see their parents show contempt to one another. They do the eye rolling, they hiss at one another. They see betrayal and infidelity. They see manipulation, games playing, and even politics in the home, where one parent tries to create factions, where one parent tries to get this side of or these kids to side with them by making their spouse look, look bad in the eyes of the children. They see a struggle for power. They see parents living like roommates, not even talking to each other. They've given up on the relationship and they are staying just because of the kids, all the while damaging them and doing them a disservice. The kids are made to be amateur therapists. They start to share things that are not meant to be talked about with children. They bring them into a battle that is not meant for them to fight. The list can go on and on. I can talk for the whole day about the kind of damage that we are doing to our children and what they are witnessing in the homes. And it's getting worse. And this is the Ummah. We are responsible for the future of the Ummah. What are we modeling? What are we showing them? I'd like you to please just say true in the comment section. If what I've shared today, right now, with regard to the state of marriages, if this sounds familiar, just type the word true. Let me see the comments. I see the comment boxes open. Jazakumullah khairan. Here we go, true. You cannot give what you don't have. A lot of parents have unfortunately unhealed childhood trauma, which unfortunately affects the values passed on to generations. May Allah bless you, perfectly said. The purpose of marriage, as Allah says in Surah al rum and verse 21, the state that couples were created, you know, it states that couples were created to give each other and obtain a life of sakina. Imagine peace. 
we have been brought together, Allah has prescribed marriage for us to attain a life of peace, sakina, and muwadda, love, and rahma, affection, and also for the propagation of the ummah. To obtain a life of sakina, a life of peace, means we have to be intentional in our desire to please each other. If we want peace, we have to be ready to be kind and compassionate. If we want peace, we have to fulfill our obligations to one another. To want, if we want peace, we have to show respect. We have to have good adab, good manners. We have to be supportive, but supportive, we have to carry each other along. We have to be faithful. We have to be God conscious and God fearing because that will keep us on the Surat al-Mustaqim of our marriage. It'll keep us on the straight path. And guess what? These are all the obligations that we will owe each other, that Allah expects us to fulfill. And he will ask us about respect, love, compassion, justice. These are all part of our obligations to our spouse. I tell couples all the time who are having challenges in their marriage, that you must go and understand what are your rights, but also what are your obligations. Fulfill that first, then come, let's talk. Both of you, wallahi, that is the foundation of a happy home. That is the foundation of a successful marriage. But most couples are ignorant. They went into this contract without even knowing what are the fine lines? What am I owing my spouse? What am I gonna have to answer to Allah for? Your spouse will go before Allah and say, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Just imagine. So your spouse is your witness before Allah. So if we want that peace, we want that sakina, we have to please each other in a way that pleases Allah. So if we want to please Allah, we will please each other. Then and only then will Allah bless our union because he knows our intention is pure because we have made him our compass and our personal qibla. We've made Allah the Qibla of our marriage. Peace is the byproduct of our output, what we do. Allah describes marriage with words like love, mercy. We're meant to dwell in tranquility, lounge in peace, happiness, and contentment. And then I keep wondering, where did that go? What happened? As a marriage counselor, love and mercy is missing in almost all the cases we have been dealing with. While I was preparing my talk yesterday with my husband, I was asking him, I said, to be very honest, if you think about the number of cases we have dealt with since we started relationship counseling, what would you say is the percentage of those who get it right? He sighed. He just kept shaking his head. And I asked him, less than 10%? Well, he said, yes, way less than 10%. Couples are not seeing love and mercy in their homes. Kids are not seeing love and mercy in their parents. I would love to hear your thoughts. What would you say is the reason how, why things have gotten so low and so bad? Why? Please share in the chat box. Why have things gotten so low and so bad? Let me see the comments. What in your opinion is the reason why things have become so bad today? I'm waiting to see comments come through. Yeah, share your responses, please. Competition, absolutely. Yeah, no taqwa, you got it. Societal pressures, yes. Pressures from family, interference, absolutely. From a professional point of view, I see maturity and respect as well as acceptance that universal partnership is embedded in relationship. That's why irresponsibility, lack of tolerance, no Iman, lack of fear of Allah. Leaders are not modeling the right behavior. Western civilization, absolutely. We have gone and imported Western cultures that are not ours. You know, a race for financial freedom. Yes, we're so busy being busy pursuing worldly things while we neglect our family. Cultural norms and expectations, absolutely. Many families are busy chasing funds. Yeah, you've got it. Jazakumullah khairan. Now, you see, upholding family values requires a true love for Allah. Many have mentioned taqwa. We know the answer. Upholding true Islamic family values requires this strong love for our Rabb. 
and a love for the deen and a strong desire that we come together for a true partnership. Ideally, both couples are fully involved and committed to the success of each other, success of the marriage, success of the children, success of the home, and success of the ummah. You have this jealousy to preserve the faith. You have this jealousy for Allah. You want his love so badly. You have this jealousy for your family. You guard it jealously. You preserve your family. You preserve your relationship with your spouse. You cherish your relationship with your children. In the farewell khutbah of Rasulullah he said, all those who listen to me, I get goosebumps every time I read this one. In his farewell khutbah, as he was taking his last steps on this earth, he said, all those who listen to me shall pass on my words to others and those to others again. And it may be that the last ones understand my words better than those who listen to me directly. It may be that the last ones understand my words better than those who listen to me directly. I think of this huge responsibility that Rasulullah has put in our, on our shoulders as custodians of Islam, as the generations long after him. Imagine 1400 years ago, here we are 1400 years later, we are generations long after him. Imagine we are meant today to model the deen better than the Sahaba. SubhanAllah, well, I, I, I literally get emotional and I am so scared when I look at the state of the ummah today. And I worry about what our children are seeing in our examples, how we relate. And the absence of seeing the example of how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi lived, how he related with his family with his neighbors, with everybody. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba fought physical battles 1400 years ago to preserve this deen for us today. We are fighting a virtual battle, a battle with the unseen, our jihad bin nafs and other people's targeted, calculated agenda for us. Yes, we people of faith and our children, we are fighting a battle of the unseen where they have strategized, they have planned for us, people of faith, to take us away from our deen and to take our children away from our deen. Yes, we are now fighting a battle that didn't exist during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But this battle is worse than climbing on a horseback and taking up arms. Then you knew what the enemy looked like. You could pick the kind of weapon you will use and the right intention to go to battle. But, but this one is the silent killer. It is our TV that we spend hours watching. It is our devices, social media, the games that we allow our kids to play. We have weaponized our own home. These things have been designed and created for addiction. Create, designed to take us away from our faith. We and our children are hooked on reality TV series, reality shows, Netflix. We binge watch TikTok and Instagram, chatting with strangers, members of the opposite gender, our so-called friends on Facebook at 1 a.m., giving them a thumbs and a likes and writing stuff that we would not want our spouse to read. I often ask, I ask, would you allow a stranger into your home at 1 a.m. to gist with you while your spouse is in bed fast asleep? Then why should we gist with someone of the opposite gender on social media? Because we don't see them. We're giving the unseen more priority than those that truly matters. If you can gist with somebody, gist with your spouse. But guess what? This is what our children are seeing in us. Of course, parents are afraid to take devices away from their children. They don't want the emotional blackmail. They want their kids to be part of you know, what's happening, what's trending. Parents are afraid to take their devices and reduce screen time. Why? Because of course it's a convenient babysitter. Then you can do other things, you can do you. But how can we even take it away when we ourselves are hooked and addicted? Wallahi, it's so pathetic when I see full grown adults addicted to K-pop. Korean pop, oh my God, Z World, the Kardashians. And look at what they are displaying. We have counseled couples 
who communicate with each other via social media while they are in the homes, even with their children. You hear they will send you a text, lunch is on the table. Or how was your day? And you're in the same house. We run a school and I will never forget a few years ago, the boy has graduated. There was a boy while he was in SF2 and I gave a talk and I was going deeper because I knew a lot of them are carrying baggage. And I remember this boy stayed behind at the end of my talk and he looked broken. And I was talking to him and he shared a horrible experience he had just before they were to resume school. How he came across in his father, his father gave him a task to do on his laptop. And he went snooping around and in his father's recycle bin, he saw nude pictures of his father and a strange woman. And he chose to write a letter to his father about what he saw. And he got the beating of a lifetime. And that same boy shared with me how when they went on vacation, we gave them two books that were written by my late mother, Allah Irhamu. And the book were Ideal Muslim Wife and Ideal Muslim Husband. And he said he read the two books as he went home. And he was so disturbed and disgusted that his father was not even fulfilling 10% of what he owed his mother. In another case, we have a girl who was reported by her classmates. This girl is in JS1. And she wrote something that was very vulgar and very explicit. And we sat down as the school, as a disciplinary committee to read and you know, ask her questions because we knew this girl had been exposed to something she shouldn't be, she shouldn't see at that age, she should never see. She said that it was her older sister who was in another school who would sneak into the mother's room at night and take the phone out. And the two of them would watch porn together. As you can imagine, we invited the parents, the parents were devastated, they were gutted. Wallahi, I still hear the mother's cries. So please, where do we start fighting this battle? Who will fix who? Parents themselves are addicted. When we counsel couples, my husband and I, you hear this one says, my husband is addicted to porn, or I am addicted to masturbation because my husband doesn't fulfill my needs. Where do you start? Who is gonna fix who? Our kids are not seeing the beauty of Islam in the home, not in the home, not in other Muslims either, in the community. Our youth are not looking up to their parents and the imams and scholars as the role models. It is the reality TV stars. It's the athletes, the stalker stars, the musicians, even the transvestites. Wallahi, even porn stars are the ones they look up to. In a case we addressed this session since September, a JS1 boy had newly come to our school and was talking in a way that some other students were very uncomfortable and they reported him to us, we sat down and had a disciplinary committee, committee meeting and we asked him, where did you learn all this stuff? He said from primary four that the kids in the senior classes five and six were talking about a particular porn star and they wrote the name of the porn star and said he should go and look for her. Wallahi. The parents again were shocked and devastated so again, where do we start when we have handed these weapons to our children with no filter, no immunization, no censorship, because it's convenient and we're busy being busy. We don't sit and talk as a family with our children. As many have said in the chat box, we're so busy pursuing. Studies have shown that families spend less than 15 minutes a week having a family discussion. So how do we pass on the baton to the next generation? When we were kids, our parents sat with us every day. Wallahi, they would sit and we would have discussions. We prayed together, we ate together. We would read books, my brother and I, we must read Ahmed de bon, bon Demfa's book on the day with the prophet. There was this huge book, The Life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We would hear stories of the seerah, before even going to school, while we were having our morning tea, they made the time. And at night, we would hear stories of their childhood and values from our culture and Islamic tradition. I am sure in the room, we have many who can relate, whose parents also shared those stories. Please write in the chat box if you agree. Just put a thumbs up if you agree that your parents shared stories with you. You had family time where your parents 
were sharing values and traditions. Yes, thank you. How many of our children can say the same of us, that we are doing the same with them? Is it that our parents were not busy then? I know we are busy today, yes. But there is this quote that I love that says, there isn't enough time to do everything in life, but there is enough time to do the most important things. There isn't enough time to do everything in life, but there is enough time to do the most important things. In Surah Al-Takathur, Allah says, the mutual rivalry, in other words, for piling up of the worldly things, diverts you. The mutual rivalry diverts you until you visit the grave. Nay, surely you will soon come to know the vanity of your pursuits. Again, nay, you surely will come to know how mistaken you are. Nay, if you knew for sure with the knowledge, if you knew with a sure knowledge, the end result of your piling up, you would not have occupied yourself with the worldly things. We have found ourselves running a school where we have to fill a void of many parents who have dropped the ball, parents who are too busy to realize what is going on in their own homes. Many times we have to tell their parents who their children are, or some who simply don't know what to do and where to start. I keep saying when it comes to marriage and parenting, ignorance is not an excuse because we will answer to Allah for it. I may be sounding a bit harsh for some, but when it comes to parenting and marriage, I will repeat, ignorance is not an excuse. As a Muslim school, we do our best to immunize our children. But when you ask them, most of them will say they didn't know most of the stuff we teach them. We teach the students about the ethical use of social media. We teach them there is a full course that my sister-in-law and my brother organize on LGBTQ plus agenda. So we immunize them so they are aware of the propaganda. So they understand how the algorithm of the social media works, that you only need to linger for a few seconds and then it is programmed that you are interested in this thing. Before you know it, you will see suggested posts, suggested posts. We get them to start being aware of this. We have courses, we offer them on atheism because they are ready. They are ready to take us away from our faith and plant seeds of doubt. We are teaching them about the ethical use of artificial intelligence because that is our reality today. We are teaching them about the effects of expo exposure to pornography, the long-term effects of addiction to masturbation and how it can affect them, their self-esteem, their marriage. Parents should be the first to immunize their children so the children are aware. The reality is parents cannot give what they do not know, what they do not have. They cannot teach what they don't even practice. Our children see what we do, not what we say, and they will model what we do. So what are your children seeing in you as a couple? You can't tell them what to do, you have to show them. And it has to be both of you. What is sad, my husband and I, again, when we're counseling couples, you hear one parent complain, I'm tying a knot while my spouse is untying the knot. So how can we pro propagate the faith and pass on the bat in the right way when we don't have our act together as a couple? From our research, like I said, less than 10% know what they're doing, whether it's parents or in their marriage. Less than 10%, in short, let's even say 10% are the ones who are trying, who are striving, who are intentional. The thing about a healthy family, a healthy marriage, parenting, nurturing a beautiful Muslim home, upholding Islamic values, we must not let it happen by accident. There is a beautiful quote from a parenting expert from South Africa, his name is Brother Idris Hamisa. He said, parenting is not so much your relationship with your child, but your relationship with your spouse. Parenting is not so much your relationship with your child, your children, but your relationship with your spouse, because we are modeling. We have to walk the talk. So if we truly want to make sure that we fulfill our obligations to our children, to the ummah, by passing on the path back on the right way to the next generation, then we must. We must get our marriages right. Whatever the nature of your relationship, if it is good, like my father says, improve upon it.
But if it is not good, then you have to wake up. It is so important to ask yourself some critical questions and not lose sight of some others. I would love to take a moment. I would love to take a moment to see what the comments are in the chat box. Let's see. Your spouse, if spouses are no, not available, you don't parent. Yeah, absolutely. The nikah ceremonies conducted these days do not dwell on the 50-50 of the relationship. It's emphasized the husband is authoritative. End of discussion. I think during nikahs, this is so important and imperative. In fact, premarital is the key. So before we sign up, <laughs> and the nuptial takes place. We need to know what we are getting into. But before anybody conducts the nikah, and I pray there are scholars who do, imams who do, we need to make this trending, that we need to explain the implications of the 50-50. We need to understand what it means. So it is important for us to ask ourselves some very, very important questions and not lose sight of others. And I'll share with you because these are things that I have been forced to do. When my husband and I had reached rock bottom, our marriage was on the rock. Wallahi, divorce was on my mind. Allah blessed me with a man who didn't ever plan to get divorced. Like, I'm in this for life. We'll perish together. We'll make this thing work. But I was very naive, very stupid and a very shifufu, if I may use that word. And it took years, almost six years, where we just kept fighting. It's not that I was the only one at fault. Even he, he had his own fault, so don't get me wrong. But we finally reached rock bottom, where for me, divorce was on our minds, and it was time to make a tough decision. And for me, I needed to figure out, you know, what do we do? Do I go back home with my head hanging down? Or do we fight? fight to make it work. And I remember a huge turning point was when my husband said, Mariam, I don't look forward to coming home to you. Subhanallah. I was like, you don't look forward to coming home to me, but you're the problem. And then I realized, okay, if he doesn't look forward to coming home to me and I'm not happy to come home to him, then we are both problems. And let me look in the mirror and see what is it that he doesn't like? What is it that I'm doing that is repelling him? And that was the beginning of the change of everything in our relationship. My husband shares this whenever he gives his talks. So I'd like to ask you a few questions. I'd like you to think about this. Why did you get married in the first place? What kind of home did you hope to build and nurture? Why did you come together? For many, it was love. Yes, they were in love. But do you honestly feel that you have attained that state you hoped for? Do you look forward to coming home to your spouse? And does your spouse look forward to coming home to you? Do your kids look forward to coming home to you? Honestly, do you look forward to coming home to your spouse? Does your spouse look forward to coming home to you? Do your children look forward to coming home to you or you coming home to them? If the answer is yes, alhamdulillah, improve upon it. But if the answer is no, then it's time to start doing some work. But how will you know if the answer is yes? You see, there's no guarantee that we will be here again next year. There is no guarantee that we will live to see another year, another Ramadan, another month and another day. But Allah will bless us for our good intentions and our efforts. I did an inventory last year, which I did with my kids and my husband separately. I, I told them my kids, they are grown-ups, they are adults, they're living on their own. But I did an inventory with my boys when they were 12 and 9, and then in recently when they were 27 and 24. And I did with my husband as well. This was last year. These were the questions that I asked, and I'd like you to reflect on this. I asked separately, what is the most important contribution that I've made to you, to your life? In what way have I added value to our relationship 
This is a question I ask my kids. Yes. In what way have I added value to our relationship? What would you say mattered most to me? Matters most to me. I ask my husband that, my children. What matters most to mama? What takes most of my time and attention? If Allah calls me home today, what will you remember me most? What would you remember the most about me? What is the best example of the deen that you have learned from me that you will never forget, that you, you are practicing and will continue to practice? I'd like to ask you the same question. What is the most important contribution that you have made to your spouse and your children? In what way have you added value to your relationship with them separately? What would you say, oh, sorry, what would they say matters most to you? What takes most of your time and attention? And if Allah calls you home today, what will they remember the most about you? What are the best examples of the deen that they have learned from you that they will never forget? And would they agree with the answers that you give to these questions? How will you know? This is a tough one. It's a difficult one. And for some to say me, ask my children those questions. Guess what? Yes. It's difficult. But I highly encourage you to do so. For me, the answers were surprising. It was a wake up call. When they were younger and I asked that questions, some of the things that I was hustling and trying to teach them, they didn't even mention. But this exercise helped me pinpoint my reality versus my perception. I may be delusional about what they are receiving because what I'm modeling is louder than what I keep saying to them, keep saying to them. What are my expectations? Is it, has it become a reality? It also serves as a wake up call. I ask them to be brutally honest and my children have learned from my husband to be brutally honest, unfiltered, say it as it is, give me, give me your best shot. But it allows one to adjust quickly because again, we don't know if we'll see another year, another month, another day. We have to constantly ask for feedback and adjust. We can't be so set in stone. This is how my parents did it. This is how I do it. Sometimes that doesn't work. It may have worked for them, but it may not work for this generation. But we have to constantly ask ourselves, how will Islamic values flourish in our homes? How will generations after us continue from where we left off? which is meant to be better than Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi example to the Sahaba. And remember, and to remember, it's not just in the home. How are we modeling Islam in our interactions? Well, one thing that truly helped me make it easier for me to be conscious all the time of what I'm modeling is to always ask myself, will Allah be pleased with me if I do this? Will Allah be pleased with me if I do that? So my thoughts, is Allah going to be pleased with me that I'm thinking this way, that I'm envying this person, that I'm about to watch this thing on my device? Will Allah be pleased with me as my role as a wife in how I please my husband, how we please each other? Will Allah be pleased with me if I say what I say, if I eye him the way I want to eye him, if I talk to my children in a particular manner? For me, my role as a spouse, as a parent, took a whole new meaning when I truly understood the verse in Surah Al-An'am where Allah said, for he it is who has made you vicegerents. For he it is who has made you. Not he's going to make you once you attain a certain level of spirituality and piety. No, for he it is who has made you. Allah says he has made us his vicegerents, his khalifas. And the word khalifa has more than one Meaning it means deputy, it means ambassador, it means representative, it means successor. Khalifa is one who improves the world for and on behalf of Allah. So we are here to serve and represent Allah in all aspects of our life. How we talk, how we think, how we work, imagine our work ethics, how we eat, how we dress, how we fight, how we relate with others. 
Every aspect of us, from the way we take in our breath, to eating, to bathing, words that come out, our thoughts literally have to be connected with, are we representing Allah as his ambassadors, as his representatives on earth? And are we also understanding that we are meant as his caliphs to protect his creation for next generations because we are successors? Do we see ourselves as guardians of Allah's creations? When it comes to, when I came across the word and the meaning of Khalifa and understood successor, it made me think so deeply that every generation inherits from the past and then is responsible for passing on the baton to the next generation, but the right way. So just as we inherited Islam from the Prophet wasallam. How he related with Allah, he related with his wives, his children, his grandchildren, his companions, his loved ones, his neighbors, his enemies, with others. How he fought. We are meant to copy his examples. Many of us have quotes, the hadiths. We keep saying it's sunnah, it's sunnah. But we cherry pick, we nitpick, we act like the sunnah is a buffet. We can do this one when we feel like and neglect this one. The same way we are treating Islam like a uniform. We can put it on when it's convenient, take it off when it's not. It is not for us to choose. At the end of the day, we will say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajibun. We say it. From him we came and to him is our return. If we know we are returning to him, then we better comply with the rules. We better know who we are, why we are here. What is our purpose on this earth? Why did he give us expo in an example like Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So that it's easy for us to copy what he modeled and we are meant to do the same. Our children, society, people are looking at us and copying us. What example are we passing on? What are we leaving behind? And is it better than the way we met it? It's so cliche to say, always leave things better than the way you met it. We see that in school, but it is so powerful when we stop and think, what does that mean? When we come, are we improving things or are we taking them back? Are we depleting? Whether we like it or not, whether we are ready or not, we are already role models. People are copying us. Look at small children, they copy each other. So imagine children are role models to one another, talk less of us adults. We are even copying our colleagues. If you can't beat them, join them. So whether we're ready or not, people are watching us. They are copying us, the way we talk, the things we do, the things we have, what we wear, how we relate with others. Are we aware of these? And do we even care? Are we passing on the baton the right way? And what are we doing to ensure that our family and the next generation see the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi example in us and understand the message better than those who heard him, who took it down, better than those who saw him firsthand. If our moral compass is not facing the right Qibla, if we don't know our deen well, what Allah wants from us as his Khalifas, then what are we going to contribute? What are we going to model? What are we going to teach? Sending our kids to Islamia and Madrasa is not good enough. It's good, but it's not good enough because our children will first replicate what they see constantly in the home. So what are we doing to hold on tight to Allah's rope as individuals and as a couple where it's Allah first, everyone who knows my dad knows that was his anthem. Allah first in everything you do. So what are we doing to hold on tight to Allah's rope as a couple? What are our family goals? Do we even have a goal for our family, for what gifts we want to give our kids? Have we discussed it with our spouse? Have we sat down, wallahi, today is a good day. We sit on our mats, we stay up all night during the last 10 days, praying for certain things, wallahi. Get you right, get your relationship with Allah right beyond Ramadan. You pray for those blessings, his barakah, his mercy, do this right. You be in order, do your marriage right, do your children right. Let others see that in you, Allah, you will be right, inshallah, before Allah. Ask yourself right now, are you comfortable with your children going before Allah as your witnesses? 
Are you comfortable with your children being your witnesses based on what they are seeing in the home right now? Are you comfortable with your children replicating exactly what they are seeing in you as a couple, how you're relating, how you're raising them? Because they will do exactly the same unless Allah gives them the knowledge, the wisdom to recognize what isn't right and change the narrative. So we have to live each day deliberately. We have to live each day consciously, each day intentionally, guided by our goals, the goals that we have for our marriage, our family, for ourselves, and knowing that we are passing the baton. One thing that is important about marriage is never lose sight of why you got married. And an important thing about parenting is to never lose sight of why you chose to have those children. They didn't ask to be born. If we do it right, our children will add value to the home. They will add value to the Oma. If we do right by our spouses, our others will see our example and want to emulate it. And again, that is an impact. That is us passing on the baton. So the Ummah is counting on us in our homes, getting in it right. And we can't get it right if we are not right. If you don't, you will end up raising children who will make living in your home hell. They will be a problem to you. They will be a problem to their families and to society and the Ummah. And guess what? You will get commission for the damage that they will cause. I love where I heard that we owe our unborn children that we marry a good spouse. Our unborn children deserve that we marry a good spouse, that we are a good person, so that together we raise them right. In my final words of upholding family values as a collective responsibility, if each of us understand our roles as Khalifas, if each of us understand our roles as successors and that we're passing on the baton, if we always ask, will Allah be pleased with me? If we put our ego aside and ask those key questions to our loved ones, if we constantly work on evolving, upgrading ourselves, the turning point that I didn't go into with my husband was when I asked him these three questions. Said, what is it about me you don't like that you want me to change? What is it about me you like that you want me to continue? And what am I not doing at all that you want me to start? This was, this is what saved our marriage. For the first time in my life, I kept my big mouth shut and I took down notes. Me, I have a mouth. I call it my weapon of mass destruction. For the first time, I kept quiet. I didn't argue. I didn't gaslight him. I didn't question him. All I asked to understand better, and I just took down notes on maturity to ask me to do the same with him. We are not perfect. And he asked me to do the same. And that was the beginning of a whole new chapter. Alhamdulillah. We pray Allah grants us to see till September, inshallah, where we would have been married for 33 years. But each day we don't take each other for granted. Wallahi, every day, just before I started this, my husband woke up, came, gave me a hug. This is a routine. Hugs me properly like I'm, I'm hugging you. I see he hugs my soul. We have to understand how this is life. If our home is in order, we can go out and thrive. The ummah will thrive because what our children see is goodness and they will replicate it, inshallah. From a very young age, I know our kids kept saying, we can't wait to get married. We can't wait to get married. And alhamdulillah, now they've reached marriage age. They are very selective. They want to get married the right way, with the right intention, for the right reasons. And they understand the responsibility on their shoulders. So constantly asking, will Allah be pleased with me? Developing a culture is all part of how you can achieve this. So put your ego aside and ask your loved ones those questions. Sit with your spouse, ask them those key questions. More recently, I've added one to my husband. How can I make you happier? If we focus on upgrading, learning, and sharing, 
if we focus on planting seeds through Allah's will, inshallah, we will smell the sweet fragrance of our Jannah. May Allah bless our homes. May Allah bless our unions. May Allah bless our children. May Allah bless our spouses. And may our spouses and our children be our witnesses before Allah. I'll never forget as my parents were taking their last breath, Allah Wallahi, I said to my mother and I said to my father the same thing. My dad died more recently of COVID. Allah And I whispered in his ears as he was breathing heavily. I said, Baba, Wallahi, I am your witness before Allah. Thank you, Allah, for this gift of my father. But Allah, take him home. I am grateful for all that he has given me, all that he has taught me, making me aware of you that you are closer to me than my jugular veins. Ya Allah, call your servant home. I am grateful for this gift. But Baba, inshallah, you will see me. I will be your witness before Allah. Until today, I pray to Allah that our children will do the same for us. May Allah bless you all. May Allah forgive us for where we have erred. May Allah forgive me. If I have erred during this presentation, if I have offended anybody, that was not my intentions. intention. May our good deeds weigh heavily on our scale and may this gathering be a witness for us in the life to come. Mr. Adishallah, I can never stop praying for Allah to bless you for putting this together every Ramadan. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much. Salaamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, we appreciate um, our facilitator and the lecturer, um, the responses to all your challenges and the interactive nature that you deliver this uh, is such that um, the messages are very clear and it's also very obvious that uh, we all realize the fact that uh, this is very topical. This is extremely important. And for the Ummah to move forward, we will need to all work on all the points that you've raised. So I will pass on the beating to my friend and facilitator, Adewale Imran Salam, who will then conduct the question and answer session. Adewale, over to you. Thank you, sir. Um, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, so we, before the question and answer, I've been reading all the charts. I posted a YouTube link where this video will be um, uh, will be uploaded on. Uh, one, immediately after this lecture, it will be uploaded on that. Uh, in addition to, uh, we have a WhatsApp group where all the contributions we which we have there, we would put all of them in the chat box and as well as a video, we will upload them so that you can actually go through all the contribution all over again. Um, that's the second one. The last one before we go to the question and answer is that we will gladly appreciate if he can, if most of the question can come in the key and the tab so that we can move through that, a lot of them. Even though we will try and um, accommodate um, some few questions from the audience tab, I can see some of our actually been raising up their hand. But most of the questions will come in via the Q and A tab. Um, so that's the that, that's the information I wanted to pass across. Um, Hadja, I have the questions already on the Q and A tab. Do you want me to read them? Because I just want to do like four from Q and A tab and two from the audience, and that's actually the I wanted to rotate that one. I've tried to clean it as much as possible so as to leave the questions there. Uh, do you want me to read it for you, or you want to take it through by yourself, Bang? No, go ahead and read it, please. Thank you. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you. Um, I will be taking four um, from Kianita, then two from the uh, audiences. I mean, I'll be rotated like that. Um, the first question is, can you, please, can you please speak to positive parenting for divorced family? It can be done right, but a lot of people don't believe so, unfortunately. That's the first one. Um, second, Can I answer that one first, or you prefer to ask all? Because it means I have to jot down the questions as you go along. Uh, okay, I want, let me do it too. Let me just make it two. two. Let me just uh, combine the two questions together. Um, sure. I'll just do one more. Uh, the second one, how do economic factors such as poverty and wealth influence the ability of families to uphold if Islamic values? 
and what strategies can be implemented to address economic disparities within the context of Islamic teachings. Um, if you can take the two months. Okay, sure. Um, you will explain the second one a bit more, but the first one with regard to positive parenting. Um, I personally, of course, we all know um, divorce is highly discouraged. It's, a, it's something that Allah does not like, but it's definitely allowed if staying in the relationship is going to make things worse, going to make things worse for you as a human being, for what your children will witness. Um, if you're being broken, abused, um, if you're depleting in value, then definitely. Um, Alhamdulillah, I was privileged enough to witness a divorce done the right way. And I, it sounds like an oxymoron to say that. Um, but yes, I witnessed someone very dear to me who went through a divorce. Du during the Idda, we actually didn't know there was a divorce going on um, because he would still sit with his wife and the children and they would be eating food together as a family. And they decided it was best they go their separate ways before things became toxic, before things deteriorated, before children ended up being damaged and made dysfunctional. Due to the dignity with which they separated, it made it easier for them to co-parent. So they are both fully involved in raising their children to the best of their ability. Alhamdulillah, um, there's been a divorce, but she still comes and stays in the guest house of the family, of his family. And Alhamdulillah, there is an, a very dignified relationship between her and his siblings. I remember specifically, I personally was very upset um, because this person was very dear to me and I was vocal in what I was saying when, the, when I learned about the divorce. And I will never forget when I was speaking to him and saying harsh words, he said, do not disrespect the mother of my children. And I'll never forget that. That was when I kept my big mouth shut and I made sure I understood they are going to grow up one day and they may hear some of the things I've said. It may be blown out of context, but it could end up being the damage he was trying to prevent. So I believe we need to understand once we commit to being parents, this parenting is for life. Our children should not be victims of us not being able to live together. Once we choose to have them, then we need to be very conscious that we don't bring them into a battle that is not meant for them to fight. We have to develop enough taqwa and a love for Allah and ask ourselves, will Allah be pleased with me if I do this or if I do that, if I say this about my spouse, my ex and so on? Will Allah be pleased with me if I separate my children from their mother? or their father, if I badmouth their mother or their father? Well, Allah, that question I said really helps me have a certain, you know, a kibla. It helps keep me grounded and keep me on track. If we are conscious and have a desire to please Allah, we wouldn't treat people badly, even if they were our ex. We are not meant to even treat people of other faiths badly, let alone the one we claimed to love once upon a time, let alone the one we chose to have children with. So we have to rise above the emotions and know that we have to handle it with dignity and grace and make sure we do not damage children in the meantime. With regard to the second question, economic, please talk to me, what is the question? <laughs> okay, the question is that, um, yes, um, economic factors such as poverty and wealth actually influence the ability of families to uphold Islamic values. Um, what the um, participant is asking is that, um, what strategies can be implemented to address economic disparities within the context of Islamic teachings. So, I mean, how do well, you manage the economic disparities within the context of Islamic teachings? Well, first of all, I don't think economy or wealth has anything to do with how we practice our faith. Um, in fact, let's look at how people in Gaza have been stripped of everything, economic independence, um, you know, shelter, food, everything. But we've never seen Iman as high as we've seen it coming from Palestine. So I feel that is a misconception that money has anything to do with that. In fact, um, it is a trial. Allah has said we have raised you by degrees above others. So we may try you with what we have bestowed, but bestowed upon you. So whether Allah has raised you to the level of being a millionaire, billionaire or bazillionaire or has tried you.
Um, it looks like um, there's a network um, glitch. Um, please, let's see. Yeah, I suddenly got kicked out. I'm so sorry. Um, so with regard to the reality of um, one's economic status, I think that should even bring you closer to Allah because Allah tests that he loves most and he will never give you a burden greater than you can handle. Now, with regard to economic disparity, let me use the context of marriage. Um, in fact, this is perfect because I know we have a lot of bankers um, in the house and um, a lot of women who are working, especially in the financial institution, many of them have shared that they are earning more than their spouses. They have become the breadwinners. Everything has suddenly shifted. Um, it's um, network again. Um, let's give Adja just um, an opportunity to rejoin back again. Subhanallah, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on. Um, why it keeps kicking me out? Anyway, um, some complain that they are carrying burdens that are not meant for them to bear. I truly believe that. In marriage, there's supposed to be a true partnership. If Allah has blessed you and elevated you above your spouse, you can never flaunt it. You can never lord it over your spouse. If you want to maintain and live a certain lifestyle that your spouse cannot give you, then be ready to bring what you need to bring to the table and take responsibility for what you want, the lifestyle you want to lead. I think no matter where Allah places you, if there is a, an economic disparity, then let it never be used to show off or show that I'm better than you. Because again, this is Allah trying you. And he has put you, he has raised you by degrees above one another. We have to be very, very careful, have the humility and the dignity to never, ever show off that we have. This is admonition to women. For men who are, of course, let's say financially independent, or men who are struggling, if you are struggling, you need to communicate with your spouse. You need to not let your ego prevent you from telling your truth, owning your truth and sharing with your spouse what you are truly going through and how you need to be more economical. How you need if that's what is needed, but we have to be ready to talk. Unfortunately, it is much harder for men to say, you know, I'm broke or I can't afford. We end up going and taking loans and trying to maintain a lifestyle just because of family pressure. No, you owe your spouse and your children to fulfill your obligations to them. That's why it's important to marry according to your class. It's important to live according to your means. And it's important to create a true partnership and a bond that allows for communication, mutual understanding. You are an open book. Everybody should know what the reality is. If you are more economically independent, you're wealthy and your spouse, your wife doesn't have it, you have to know part of her rights is you owe her an allowance. This is written by Allah, not by Maryam Lemu. Please don't cuss me out in the chat box. This is part of your her rights over you, that she is owed an allowance that you mutually agree upon. And you are meant to give it to her based on whatever you decide, what you negotiate. It can be monthly, it can be weekly, it can be quarterly or annually. That's between you and your spouse. Your spouse is meant to be reasonable and not demand that you give them more than what you have, what you can afford, of course. But again, that's why if you have a true partnership, like my husband, I say he's my buddy, he's my buddy. He's my bestest best friend. Passion comes in seasons, up and down, up and down, but be friends first and be consistent and steady with that one. Be each other's confidant, you know, have each other's back. Then it's easy for free flow of communication, for expressing what is truly in your heart and soul. So for me, I think that's all I can say with regard to 
um, economic factors, but definitely economic factors should not affect, affect your relationship with your rub. Thank you, Ajia. I will take one more from the key and data before going to the audience. Um, I'd first just be ready. Um, after these questions, you will go out next. Um, Salam alaikum, Hadia. Is it permissible for a male child to plait or braid his hair? I have a running battle with my 17 year old college band son on this issue. He feels I'm unfair to him, and he told me he has already spoken to a Muslim scholar and he was assured that plating of hair by male Muslims is allowed. He further did the research, which I couldn't get to fact check, that the Prophet وسلم, at the time braided his hair into four parts due to it. He has refused to cut his big afro hair. I think mm -hmm. uh, I think you need to. I mean, if you can just answer, this, we'll go to audience then next. Yeah, um, of course. I think peer pressure um, cultures, depending on what part of the world you are, which country you send your child to. Here, even in Niger, same thing. It's normally peer pressure. It's the trending thing. It's fashionable. Hey, look at us here. Me, I'm 51, and we Afro was reigning around the you know 60s, 70s, and so on. And some people in the house right now spotted Afros. It didn't make them a lesser Muslim, um, but I think. With regard to the technical question, I, I'm not a scholar. I have to always express that. And I've actually not done any research as to whether it's Islamic or not. One thing I know for sure is we should never try and look like women. However, if the braids, I think, if I remember correctly, during the time of the Prophet وسلم, we have had some of the Sahaba who have braided their hair in one strand at the back. However, I'm not a scholar, so I can't go into the technical aspect. I do know that if you force a child not to do something, that's when that thing becomes more appealing. And if it's something that is not clearly stated on Islamic, we have no right to put something as haram that has not been made haram by Allah, because we will be committing a form of shirk because we are taking the role of Allah. So we have to be very careful, but I leave this to the scholars. We may have some in the house or in the chat box who can shed a bit more light on it. So um, for me, I know you have to be careful when you put pressure. In our school, let me give a quick example. Um, we have a policy. Every two weeks, you cut your hair and you cut it low, like crew cut. And our children hate it. The boys hate it. But we're like, you must look neat. Cleanliness is next to godliness. And you are meant to have ihsan, excellence in everything about you. Definitely, there's nothing ihsan about Afro, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, that's just my opinion. However, we notice when our kids graduate or when they go on holiday, they spot full bushy hair that looks like they are madmen in the market place. But because they know it's a rule, then this gives them that freedom to say they're going to do as they please. You know, they're going to do that thing that we said they shouldn't do. So we as parents have to be very careful and sometimes reduce how hard we put our foot on the brakes of certain things. If they are not clearly in black and white considered, you get to discuss what is your vision? What does family look like? How do we imbibe Islamic values in our children? If that's something that is important to you, which of course it should be for every Muslim couple. Um, during premarital, you get to check off certain boxes and see that, yes, this seems to be exactly what I'm looking for before you say I do. Well, now the reality is we are talking years and years of marriage. But then you said after like 10 years, things suddenly change. Things didn't suddenly change. Most couples get so comfortable in the relationship that they don't notice the little, little changes that are happening. But things didn't suddenly change. Sometimes maybe it's a new job. Sometimes it's the kind of friends that somebody has that have influenced them. Let me give an example. Um, there's a lady who they were living in harmony, in peace with, their hus with her husband, and then she got a position in a high office and she had to work with people where she needed to exert authority and she needed to be very strong. And um, unfortunately, that uniform she wore when she was working started to follow her to her home. And she started to speak in a very condescending way to her husband, the way, not just condescending, but she started to take on boss, boss babe in the house. And um, unfortunately, the husband would observe, they would have fights. Why are you speaking like this? And she's like, like, like how, you know, and this and that. And next thing he says, over a few years, I ended up feeling like I was married to a man in the house because there was a struggle for power, struggle for authority, and so on. 
a real marriage is about a partnership where you see each other as equals. Allah says he has created for you mates, but he has raised the man a degree above us, we women. So they are the awam. They are the, the ones to lead the way. And we must not mess with Allah's decree, so to speak. So for me, since my man has shown that he is responsible, he has earned his stripes, he has gotten my respect, he is very faithful, he's constantly reminding me of the deen and what I'm doing wrong, and he'll say, don't do that, don't talk like that, say astaghfirullah, and he doesn't say it like, say astaghfirullah, no, he's, Maryam, I don't think you should say that, <laughs> and this and that. So it allows me to quickly adjust, and I was like, okay, yes, I know, this is a culture my husband doesn't want me to have, and I respect that. So wherever he will go, I will follow him. Let's do convoy, Muji, I will go. That is something that is important for us to realize and understand about marriage. Then, with regard to your question about you are tying a knot and your spouse is untying a knot, that is a big issue. Now, if you make sure that before you have children, you have discussed what seeds you want to plant in them. Again, this can go back to premarital or it can go back to the marriage itself. You've gotten married, but you're yet to have kids. Well, like my husband told me when we got married, he said, I'm not ready to have children. And I can tell you're not either. And he says, I have excess baggage and childhood trauma that I'm dealing with. And I need time to finish healing before I bring a child into the world that I do not want to damage because of my scars and wounds. But you are very immature. And I use the word shishifufu. I was very shishifu. I was an airhead. And I was not capable. I wasn't, not that I wasn't capable. I wasn't fit to be a real mother. So, and then we were fighting and my husband's like, we cannot bring a child into a world where they will see chaos, where they will see fights. We need them to come and see us working as a team because of the responsibility and the amana of being parents. So we waited. Our first child did not come till seven years with Allah's blessing after our marriage. So this is real intentionality. And thank God I married a correct man. My kawam knew where he was. He, had the, it's, he has a personal kibla, a, a direction that's facing a good kibla, facing what will please Allah. So I got married at 18. And which one do I know? Most of us will get married pom, one year later, nine months later, we start popping kids like rabbits. So now you have kids and there was no discussion beforehand about what seeds you want to plant, how you want to raise them. You can't say you didn't know that your spouse is not taking his faith seriously. It's not possible. You're with them. They, you know them better than their parents. So by the time you're in a marriage like that, these are things you have to. So for those who it's already happened, I am sorry. For those who are yet to please, please listen hard and loud to what I'm saying. You have to make sure you do this thing. You check off these boxes before you bring a child that didn't ask to be born into this world. So I would say this is the time you sit, you talk, you ask, should you walk away? I will never be the one to say walk away from this relationship. That is you. You have to know what can you live with? What can't you live with? You have to pray. You have to do istikhara. And then you have to fight. You have to fight to make it work until you see no other options. Your children are growing. Yes, they are seeing. Are you planting seeds intentionally in them? Are they getting to see why it's important they do? Because if they know the makasid, they know the why behind injunct injunctions of Allah. Nobody can stop them. Not even their dad. Once you do you, your part right, get them to understand why this is important. I remember my youngest son from a young age seemed to have this love for Allah. He had this love for Islam and making sure he pleases Allah. And he doesn't mess with his prayers. And he's the kind who, as an adult, if you tell him, come, let's go do this. Wallahi, he will say, I'm sorry, I have to pray. And he'll go and pray first. And he doesn't care who it is. He will not be rude, but he will do that. Pray. He will do Allah first. He will not lie. He knows he will be in trouble. He will not lie. So you have to be more intentional now in exposing them to the makasid. Why did Allah prescribe this for you? Why did Allah prescribe that for us? Make sure you get to inject this in them and immunize them so that when somebody tries to take them off the Sarat al -Mustakim, you are what you have put in them is germinating and they have their own internal compass that's facing the right Gibla. I'm sorry, it's a long answer, but it was a complicated question. 
it, it indeed the um, it, it indeed the right answer. I mean, detailed answer for that. Thank you, man. I we have about. Um, I'll take more people from um, Alaji Bilo Machido next. Um, please uh, make your contribution or question very short, please. Um, we have lots of people raising <clears> their <throat> hand, and we have about twenty-two um, um, people in the K and A tab. And we are actually time box to 12 o'clock, which is in the next 30 minutes time. Alaji uh, Bilo Machido next, and thereafter, after work and then. Alaji Bilo Machido. Uh, Mrs. Lemu, salam alaikum uh, to all the brothers and sisters. Um, thank you very much for a very uh, informative and uh, certainly very uh, uh, useful lecture that we all have a lot to take away. I am just uh, trying to understand where this crisis of um, where this crisis of, of marital relationships and also uh, also the crisis uh, evolving into into um, into effect on behavior of children. I mean, how it became exacerbated. I'm asking this question because, I mean, I come from a traditional background. I come from a traditional background. And to be honest with you, during the time we were growing up, I mean, my, my late father was a polygamist. Um, he had a number of children. I happened to be among them. And there was clear leadership. There was clear leadership of the of the father or the husband in the family and it did not mean or translate to abuse of the women who are his wives so because of that even us the children actually grew up in an atmosphere of harmony but i'm just seeing that having also been educated in the Western world. I, I schooled outside the country in the United States. I mean, I was very quick to, to see the differences in model, in family set of family models, which um, in my book, I don't know if I'm right, contributed in some way in, in making us those of us that come from a Muslim background um, in some kind of state of confusion, because you know you clearly define that yes, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala was clear that this is a contract of equals, but with the man being um, being 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 the leader, the clear leader who who sets the compass. Truly, I my experience when I was in school. I didn't see that. And I could see why our own family system um, was, was, was better and probably more, more, more acceptable maybe to me. Um, so as a result, you, under that system, you see more conflict, which like you rightly said, impact on the children who observe these things and it becomes, you know, the their own way of thinking that probably this is the way the funds dysfunctional. I am just asking, I don't know if I'm right. Is there any role in our deviation from our core Islamic family setup? You know, to one that it's less Islamic in terms of out, outlook that you see as contributing to, as contributing to, um, as contributing to the crisis both at the home and also with the children. Do you see it as a contributory factor? And just as a slight rider to that question, also, um, um, I was just observing that. A lot of your lecture um, was focused a lot on monogamy. Um, um, is it is it is it the case, or is it that uh, you are uh, just 
given examples, but that the principles you are outlining were actually applicable to polygamous situations. So, uh, I thank you very, very much. You have been very informative and educative. Thank you. And God bless us all in this holy month of Ramadan. Amen. 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 I know the question, I have to try and filter and see if I understand the specific question, but let me just share uh, some of my, our th my thoughts. Uh, I think today one of the biggest um, issues that is causing us challenges is we keep allowing culture to come and interfere with faith. And then it's the lines start to become blurry. Um, for any marriage that goes based on what Allah wants, where the foundation is built on Allah's rules of this is what the role is of the man. This is role, the role of the woman. This is the rights the woman has over her husband. These are the rights, the unique rights this man has over his wife. If we follow that, we won't be having the kind of problems we have. If we hold on tight to Allah's rule and have taqwa. So this applies to any generation. The problem we are having is like I shared, our faith has been diluted a lot. We're importing cultures that are not meant for us. Um, we, there is already a deliberate campaign to take us away from Islam. So what are we watching? Over time, so much is getting diluted and blurry that we don't even recognize what is what anymore. There's so much fake on fake news everywhere, fake hadiths, fake, fake quotes from the Quran that we don't even have the ability to decipher which is real, which isn't, because we are not knowledgeable enough. But there is a criteria. And the more we dig deeper into understanding the faith, and like I use the word makasid or sharia, we get to understand the why behind Allah's injunctions and the criteria used to know what is from Allah and what is not. Um, it means we have to go on a lifelong quest to learn um, you know, and understand our faith better so we can practice it better. Then by the time we get married, it's much easier for us to propagate the faith and raise children who see the right example in us. Now, your question with regard to polygamy, sorry, let me go back again. Um, regardless of what part of the country, or what part of the world you are in, or whether you grew up in a traditional home and you went to the West, like my husband, he grew up in a home where he was the eldest of 30, uh, 26 children. And he was the first. And eventually he went to school in the US and he stayed there for about 22 years. But Wallahi, you've never met a man who was held on tight to Allah's rope and held on tight to the good values of our traditions and customary norms and so on. He is, while we were there, there were things he just doesn't do. Why? Because it's not part of our culture. And he made sure he made it clear, I will not do it either because it's very easy. I was at a very impressionable age. I was still a teenager and could easily just want to fit in and do what everybody is doing. But he kept reminding me of my past and my roots. So by the time he came back, nothing changed because he didn't change. That was the good in him. That was the good of our culture, the good of our faith that you hold on to. So regardless, again, of where you are in the world, where you go, how exposed you are, and another thing with my husband that I respect the most is he was able to recognize and identify what he, and he said this in lectures, where he felt his father went wrong and continues to pray. He fasts, does sadaqah for Allah to forgive his father for his shortcomings. But he openly says, I saw what my father did wrong in polygamy. And I told myself, I will never subject my wife or wives or children to the same things that I saw that I didn't think were right. And when it comes to polygamy, justice is key. You have to treat each wife equally. There's no one wife is better than the other in the eyes of Allah. What my personal views are of polygamy, it's a personal thing. I came and married a man who said, I don't want to go into polygamy. My mother was in a polygamous marriage, Allah irhamahu. Bless her heart, my stepmother, may Allah bless her. I love my stepmother so much because she taught me a lot about our culture. She taught me how to speak nupi. She taught me how to cook food. And so I feel indebted to her. She, she took care of my brother and I better than I feel she even took care of her own children. She loved us. So I saw beautiful polygamy in how my father did everything as humanly possible as he could to be just, but he's human. Everybody knows Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved Aisha dearly. 
And he loved Khadija radiallahu anha dearly that Aisha was jealous. And so were the otherwise jealous of how much, even though Khadija radiallahu anha had passed away, but he loved her that much. And at that time, polygamy, uh, monogamy was a sunnah. And then polygamy is also a sunnah. So we have to recognize Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had Aisha radiallahu anha alone. Uh, sorry, Khadija radiallahu anha alone until she passed away. And then polygamy now was permitted and it shouldn't be more than four. But if you can't be just, then marry only one. My husband said, I, where did I finish with one? He's always asking me, where am I? Am I owing you anything? Please don't go and do I'm about to allies. There's something you haven't told me that I'm not doing. So we are misunderstanding how we, we don't even practice polygamy right. It's not you have a man married to four wives. No, it is each wife has her husband. So go do your love in Tokyo. I don't care, but please love me, respect me, dignify me, treat me well, be fair. It's not take one whole and divide it into four. Everybody take your quarter. No, you must fulfill. So with regard to your question, the rights and obligations of couple, it's for anybody that you get married to and invoke Allah's name to witness the nikah. Then you owe them 100% their rights. You can't divide it. It's not to be spread equally. It is fully, 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 fully. And my husband said, Kai, Gaskia, I do not want Allah to ask me if I was just and if I was fair. So let me just respect myself and stick to one and see how I can. And he said, it is hard. And marriage is hard with one alone. But if you're intentional and you're ready to do it right, then do it. But get married to more than one for the right reasons. Not because, like somebody said to my husband, at least you get a different flavor every night. What is that? That's why Allah prescribed marriage. It was prescribed to protect women. Women were widowed. Their men had been killed in battle. They needed shelter. They needed protection. They needed a kawam. So for us, we need to recognize the reason, the makasit behind Allah prescribing marriage in the first, um, polygamy in the first place and not lose sight of that. It's not about our intimacy and fulfilling our lustful needs. And the more kids we have, each child has 100% entitlement to us raising them right. And when we have kids, my husband and I have two children by Allah's blessing. But we need to also recognize that sometimes we have so many kids, we don't know them in this day and age when they have these dangerous weapons called devices and we're popping kids right like rabbits. Each child will go to before Allah as our witnesses. So we have to know we are literally play, playing with fire. We have to be ready to be devoted, both of us, procreating, consummating the marriage and procreating, having children is the two thing. It's not about one taking more responsibility. It's about both knowing what they are getting into and the why do they want to have kids? What seeds do they want to plant? And then hold each other's hands and do it together, knowing it's not going to be easy, but it's for life. And inshallah, they will be your witnesses before Allah. May Allah guide us in the best manner. I'm sorry if I got a bit carried away there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we'll go to the... Um... Okay, go ahead, sir. Can I go ahead? Yes, please. Right. Please, please make it very brief. We want to go back to the key and make, uh, make it very brief. Okay, I will. Salam alaikum wa ta'ala wa Please, uh, I'm happy about the press of lecture for today. That is a very informative and enriching one. Please, I have a question for you. I'm quite a very disturbing and emerging trend. What would be your advice for a, a, bat, a wife who, who was originally a Christian on her own times and volition she turned to Islam? She went on Hajj. But in recent time, I observed a return and a subdue return to Christianity so much that uh, our last child is getting impacted. Like I said, it's very disturbing. What would you advise on this issue, ma'am? Thank you. Jazakallah, Hiran. Um, yeah, this is a difficult one. Um, first of all, uh, did she get 
did she embrace Islam because she wanted to get married? Sometimes parents and family members will, or even the man will say, you have to be a Muslim before my family will allow me to marry you. And they do. If the intention is not coming from a sincere place, how many people have we seen embrace Islam for marriage, then the husband dies and they revert back to their previous faith. Um, Islam is meant, there's no compulsion in religion and they are meant to um, get married, uh, sorry, embrace Islam because they want to. And we are all encouraged to encourage others to come to Islam, but it is never meant to be forced. So if somebody came in unwillingly, another thing is how much of the beauty of Islam have they seen in you, in your example in the home? Have you been intentional in making sure that, you know, you are both growing spiritually? Um, going for Hajj does not make someone a good Muslim. Going, building a mosque does not make me a good Muslim. We have to recognize that, you know, Islam is a relationship between us and Allah and pure intentionality that everything we do, every act we do is to please him, knowing we are going back to him. So I truly think in this particular case, it's a tough one because like you said, the younger child is now being influenced. Um, when people say, why is it not encouraged? Why should a woman not marry a Christian man? Why should a Muslim woman not marry a Christian man? Um, but why are they allowed to marry? Mus uh, why is the Muslim man allowed to marry a Christian woman? Well, they are Ahl al-Kitab, but for a woman to marry a Muslim man, a Christian woman to marry a Muslim man, the man is still the kawam, he's the head and he gets to call the shots. But of course, done with dignity, done with grace and carry someone along. The man is the one who could say, this is the faith that my children will be in. And how involved is that man in nurturing the children and in influencing them? Because the mother is the first school. So if you didn't get it right to make sure she is 110% fully committed to the faith and propagating Islam and handing over the baton, then there needs to be some kind of damage control. You really need to come to the table to talk, to talk about the seeds and this goalpost being moved. Like when I married you, I wanted my children to be Muslim and this is how I thought or what I want us to raise them with, these values, the principles of our faith. And I see you are deviating. I see you are going to Christianity, but I feel there should be accountability. What is it that we didn't do to keep her in the faith? What is it that she didn't see that made her attracted to another faith? If, and I just need to clarify, if a man is, if a Muslim woman marries a Christian man, he can choose to say, serve pork, serve alcohol in the house and you can't say no. Um, there are things that are forbidden in Islam. Anal sex is one. If a man who's a, a Christian says, this is what I want, you as the woman have to satisfy your husband with his stomach and when it comes to intimacy needs. And you are the woman, you must submit to him. So the, I needed to clarify that for those who may be wondering why is it not allowed the other way around? And there are so many other reasons. Inheritance is another one. But with regard to this particular one, it needs you to go back to the drawing board. You need to sit as a couple and discuss and find out. She can't have just suddenly stopped practic practicing Islam one day. It's a gradual thing, but it's, it will keep getting stronger and stronger unless you both sit and discuss. Let's look at the long-term goals for our relationship. How do we instill these values in our children? This is what I want for them. And you also have to play your part. You have to still plant seeds. You have to sit with them and grab your children, hold the bull by the horn and share the beauty of Islam in them. Otherwise they will feel, you know, I'll go with the one who makes the faith look more beautiful. So you have to be conscious. You have to be intentional. You have to be deliberate in making sure you are a hands-on parent. What I loved about my husband is how from pregnancy, he was so involved. He would be speaking to the child who was not yet born. And the child was born. He says, Mariam, I need you to express milk. I want to be involved in feeding, bottle feeding the baby. And he was involved. He did diaper duty. He would let me go rest. He would take the child. So he has developed such a strong bond with the boys. And when I listen to their conversation, they're talking about deep stuff. Now, of course, they're all adults. They're told, they share their deepest secrets, their biggest fears, and their emotional roller coaster with their father. So the role of the dad culture has made us deviate. But when we look at 
when we look at the example of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he related with his wives, how he related with his children, how he related with his grandchildren. You know, we try to do culture, I'm the father, I'm the boss, and people should, our children should be afraid of us. You will lose them, especially today. We will lose our kids because they're always looking for someone to look up to. They're looking for a role model. So parents should be the coolest, the hippest thing on earth for them. And they should hang on to their every word and want to please their parents and want to please Allah through their parents and directly. So we need to be very conscious of that responsibility that's on our shoulders as parents, that once we've had them, we have a responsibility we must fulfill. So this one requires go back to the drawing board, sit and have a heart to heart conversation with your spouse. This is happening, but you can't sit on the back seat and be watching someone grab the steering wheel of your marriage and go off wherever they want to. You have to be the driver. The man has to be the driver of the relationship. May Allah guide us all. May Allah lighten your load and make this easy for you because it's it's really going to be a tough one. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, ma'am. We'll go back to the Q&A tab now. Um, I do recognize um, some of our um, learned colleagues and our fans that has been supporting your lectures with um, quotes from the Quran and their this. Uh, I think everybody is actually seeing it in the web chat. This is actually contributing greatly to the discussion. Um, so we will go to the Kiani tab now, um, uh, so that we can. The next one on the Kiani tab, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Miriam. Which videos in your premarital course singularly or as a package will you say focus on parenting specifically? Do you have such a bond? If not, you'll be making one or some. And I think um, somebody has already answered it on the, on the chat link. They will post your email there, your Instagram and YouTube. So if you do visit those Instagram and YouTube, you see all the videos from Ajia Miriam Lamo on uh, parenting and um, on other counseling areas too. Um, just to quickly, I just want to say, yes, I do have um, a full 72 video premarital course that's available online. I just shared the mariamlemu.com. If you go there, you'll see courses at the top. There's a full premarital course that covers everything from what you need to know before you get married, what you need to do to prepare, and what you need to know once you are married, your rights, your obligations. In fact, there's a free PDF on that site that you can download that goes Uh, why are you taking this course and they said we've been miserable for 18 years and we wanted to go back to basics to start and see what we missed so for me i think it's important yes in there there is a lot on parenting a lot on the cautioning of making sure you do it right before you go into having children and bringing kids into this world may allah guide us all sorry to interrupt you that's fine that's one thing thank you very much man. Um, the next one, the uh, next question is actually a 16-1 question. And it, yeah, uh, those questions you are have not questions. allowed me to speak anyway. Okay. Aji, uh, Alaji Lawal, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Alaji Lawal. Thank you very much. I've been trying to speak. Well, I think uh, the lecture by Sayida Mariam is quite comprehensive and it has taught everything. And I can simply say that she has given us important we we'll start developing marriage culture, appropriate marriage culture guided by Islam. And uh, I also wish to congratulate her for being 33 years in the business of marriage. I'm slightly, we're slightly nine years older than you. So <laughs> we are 42. And uh, we have made it successful in the sense that it has been a collaborative effort. Importantly, I happen to have a wife who is an educationist and I have been a finance man. So I leave the responsibility of educating, putting them through the right behavior in terms of upbringing and what have you, and I give the support in whatever they need towards financing the requirements for such. And marriage, like I've said, is something which requires both couple to be discussing, understanding one another, sharing responsibilities is very important for a successful marriage. And when you have a family, I think there is need for family meetings amongst members of the family. And you discuss issues and evaluate 
and also you monitor and evaluate the conduct of each member of that family. I think it's very important for a successful family life. But I'll ask you one question. Who is to be blamed most when relationship fails? Don't tell me the husband. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, no, assalamu alaikum. Um, I can't blame anyone um, because obviously as counselors, we have to hear the whole. We have to listen to both sides. Um, but what we try to do is make individuals take responsibility and point out certain things. So every marriage is unique. Every marriage is different. There's no one marriage that is identical to another. So there's no way we can say we will blame a particular spouse that they are responsible. Um, but what I think I can say is I blame couples who ignore warning signs, who go into marriage blindly without the prerequisite knowledge, who go into marriage without um, doing their homework, investigating the person they want to get married to. If those who go into marriage just believing love will sustain the relationship. I blame couples who choose to finally get married and think it will run on autopilot. Um, you've been married over 40 years. May Allah continue to bless your union. You need to, as you know, it's like a well-oiled machine for the marriage to work and be successful. You have to keep oiling. You have to keep servicing. You have to keep improving it. Um, and that applies to life in general, even if we're not married. So everything you want out of your marriage, you earn it. And if you use Allah as your guide, as your compass, as your personal Qibla in the relationship, right there you've got the blueprint of how to make the marriage work. And whoever drops the ball is now responsible. But you cannot sit in the back seat and leave the reins to someone else and later come and say, you know, you crashed my car, you crashed my marriage. It's not a blame game. It's about taking responsibility and taking ownership. You have to own your marriage. And I would say for you, may Allah continue to bless your union. It would be so interesting, Alaji, if you could ask your children. I'm sure they are all grown now. As I said, I did this exercise just last year with my kids. I asked that question. And what if you ask your question, your kids now, what would you say is the most important lesson I've taught you? What's the biggest impact I've had in your life? If Allah called me home today, what is it about me that you will never forget? What are the most Absolutely. important values of the faith that I have imparted to you? It'll be interesting. I'm not saying you should answer it, but I'm just saying these are important questions that I would highly encourage you now that they're grown up and you've been married for so many years, because it's a litmus test to know how you're doing. You may not see another Ramadan. Allah, Allah knows best. But the good thing is at least you get to know so that you can make any adjustments or maybe not and just say, Alhamdulillah, Allah has accepted all your prayers and your wishes and expectations of how you hope to nurture a beautiful Muslim home. Allah knows best. Okay. And Alhamdulillah, I will find, I'll close with a quote from you. There is enough time to do the most important things in life. Thank you Absolutely. very much. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have five more minutes before I hand over to Dr. Adedotan. Um, so these are three questions in one, um, which I just really wanted to um, get in there. Um, there's a question on what's the uh, speaker opinion on Muslim men and Christian women, particularly the impact on the children. That is Muslim men marrying Christian women. That's number one. Um, uh, that's number one. Number two. And just in tandem with what Aladi has said now, um, the extent is that who has the major responsibility of raising the children in marriages, especially their dean? So take that one, take those two questions, Aja. Okay. The second question, who has the responsibility? It's both of you. Um, all of us as Muslims are meant to ensure to the continuity of the faith. So we each are responsible for major responsibility. Oh, made, so ask the question again. Who has a major responsibility of raising the children in marriage, especially their dean? Major responsibility. If it's again the couple. Major oh. responsibility is the couple because parent, we will each be held accountable. There's nowhere where it says the man will be held accountable more than the woman for raising the children or the woman will be held accountable more for raising the children. The children will tell Allah what each parent taught them. 
And so we are 110% responsible, each of us, for making sure we plant the right seeds in our children and uphold the faith, uphold the dean. So definitely it's a joint responsibility, um, to the best of my knowledge, let me put that word. Um, sorry, what was the first question you asked? Uh, uh, a Christian on, on Muslim men marrying Christian women. Mm. Well, I touched on it lightly, um, but again, a Muslim man marrying a Christian woman, if she chooses, if you marry a Christian woman and she wants to practice her faith and you agree and you go ahead and marry her, then you cannot stop her, number one. If she wants to eat pork in the house, you cannot stop her. If she wants to drink, you cannot stop her if that's what she wants for her lifestyle. If she, if you're not home and her children want to eat what mama, my mother is eating, you won't be there. You cannot dictate. You won't be everywhere. There are a lot of reasons why, I mean, it is allowed, but it is discouraged as far as, oh, I, let me, in fact, let me rephrase that. I discourage it unless you have a wife who 110% is committed to helping you bring the goal you have of instilling Islamic values in your children. Some couples have been able to make it work. So that's why I feel I have to rephrase it. For some, it has worked and you don't find, but most couples you will see the house is divided. You will find maybe the boys have followed the father, the girls have followed the mother, could be the other way around. And you as a successor, knowing that the next generation is succeeding from you, as a man, as a woman, you have to recognize this is a responsibility for you to make sure we continue to pass the baton. And if you are married to someone who isn't a Muslim, I've seen many cases where the father has died and the mother takes all the children to church and there's nothing you can do, you're not there. It was a choice you had and you made that choice. So you have to recognize there are consequences, but sometimes there are unique few cases where it does work. And there's a healthy symbiotic relationship and it does not affect the deen or the values or the Islamic culture that you want to imbibe. But it means the husband has to double up because you are the one to teach it. She doesn't know the faith. So that's it. Allah alam. Thank you. Um, this is the last question I will be able to take before handing over. And that question is actually four in one. The number one question is, that, what if, the question is, that, what if you discover after marriage that your values don't align? I mean, the husband and the wife. Second one is, do you believe that some are good at putting on a mask that even after premarital classes that you discover that they are of opposite of what they have portrayed during that session? Um, the number three is, how do we deal with two children with opposite personalities in the same home? That is, one is rebellious, rebellious and the other one calm and obedient without being unfair to both. And then the last one, in that particular, in that one is that what would you advise a diverse couple who are trying to get back, but one notices that the disease not change in the other? It's even though you are going back to square one or even worse. So those are the four questions. I am not going to be able to answer them all uh, at once. You have to literally start all over again. Okay, What's what the you, first you question? Have, um, the first question and, and second are actually related. They are the same question. Is it like a continuation? Um, the person is asking that, what if you discovered after marriage that your values don't match? And that do you believe that some people are very good at putting on a mask, even during dating and during counseling, during premarital counseling, and then you discover they are opposite of what they are portrayed during that session? It's just like- Okay. Um, Definitely, um, we are meant to ask as many questions as possible before we get married. Before we get married, we're meant to do our homework, investigate the person we want to get married, sit and have a discussion. The premarital discussion is so critical to the success or failure of your marriage, because that's when you are able to see if your values align, if you're on the same page, where you discuss goals for your marriage, goals for the, your relationship, how you plan to relate, how you plan to fight, um, because you're meant to talk about how do you handle you know, conflict, what way would you rather, if something is bothering me, I talk about. So there's so much that, for instance, I cover in my course that, you know, allows you to know what to do, how to check off all the boxes. Then you now get married to someone and you find your values are not aligned, but they were aligned before marriage. You've, as long as you've done your istihara beforehand, as long as you've done your istihara beforehand, and you have opened your eyes wide. You're not delusional and so in love that you are ignoring warning signs. You have addressed concerns 
to the best of your ability. Then you get married and then you find things are changing. You need to go down to the root cause to see what's wrong, what is changing. Again, is it external influence? Because that is a force to be reckoned with. Has their environment changed? Has the company they keep changed? You need to be conscious of that. Like my husband, I had a friend who he didn't support and he didn't subscribe to our relationship. He put his foot down and says, I want you to cut off this friendship. This is a childhood friend. I grew up with this person. I love them so much. We thought alike. We did everything together as teenagers. And then my husband says, oh, wallahi, that was such an important thing that he did to change my life. And I'm so grateful that he cut off because it's later when the, you know, the, the eyes have cleared, I realized this person was actually not good for me. And most of the biggest trouble I got into as a teenager, they were part of it. So they had a huge influence over me. So, but if values change, you need to sit down again, go back to the drawing board and see what's going on. Re-establish goals for the relationship. If you've never had goals for your relationship, then start now. Today is a good day to say, you know what, let's sit, let's set goals. I realize that we have just been, you know, sh shooting in the dark, but let us create any human being needs goals and a sense of direction and a purpose. So have a purpose, something you're working towards and discuss it. And if you see that your spouse is no longer subscribing to your values, your principles and the direction you want to go, do your istihara and ask Allah to guide you whether you should stay in that marriage or not. For me, that's the best advice I can give with regard to that. What was the second question, sir? The concluding question is, um, how do we deal with two children with opposite personalities in the same home? One is rebellious, rebellious and the other is quiet and calm without being unfair or seem to be unfair. To mm -hmm. May Allah bless my mother, Allah and um, my, I was the rebellious teenager. I was the stubborn one. I was, in fact, anti-Islam, believe it or not. I grew up with Islam presented to me on a silver platter. My parents... Um, established the biggest Muslim Islamic organization, um, Islamic Education Trust. My mother was the mother of Form 1. I saw Islam. They both authored so many books on Islam. People reverted to Islam because of the books they wrote. And then there I was, rebellious, stubborn. I was judged because I wasn't Muslim enough uh, or I wasn't behaving like Sheikh and Aisha Lemu's daughter enough and I went the opposite way. If you put me side by side with my brother Nuruddin, he was like an angel. <laughs> we were like night and day. were lie. My mother never judged us like that. She just knew that she needed to handle me in a better way. And she allowed my dad to do the disciplining. And my, my dad did not spare the kin. Anytime I misbehaved um, and I crossed the line, definitely there were consequences. But my parents never made me feel inadequate or that I wasn't good enough. They just talked and over talked and continued to plant seeds. And Allah's time is the best because I never, ever thought that I would go from a period where I wasn't practicing Islam. I wasn't dressing in hijab for all the years I lived with my husband in America. About 11 years, I didn't cover my hair. I was wearing short dresses and everything. And then today, I am the one who is encouraging people to practice the faith sincerely. Allah's time is the best, and he guides those who will. What my parents kept doing, though, is planting seeds. And the seeds that my parents planted in Allah's time were able to germinate, alhamdulillah. And I pray Allah forgives me for my shortcomings. So with regard to children, don't. The worst mistake a parent can make is to compare kids, to compare siblings. Even my two younger, my two children are very like night and day. One is very like me, stubborn, rebellious, strong-headed. And the other one is uh, more easygoing and calm. But they are both beautifully unique in their own way. They all have their unique strengths. This one who is stubborn has some strengths that his younger brother wishes he had. And this one has some attributes that he sees as his younger brother that he wished he had. And that is life. That is the beauty of Allah's creation. Ours is just to be very conscious of planting seeds. And like some of the prophets, you can plant seeds. They may not germinate during your lifetime. But the good thing is, inshallah, the fruits will be yielded in the hereafter. So just be intentional, giving goodness, giving words of affirmation, teaching them values of service and contribution that they're not here to freeload. Don't raise entitled children or you'll be doing the world a disservice. You'll be doing their spouses and children a disservice. You have to teach them good values from our faith and from our culture so that they grow up to understand that they are citizens meant to contribute, not to be a waste of space, not to freeload, but to do something and leave something better than the way they met it. May Allah guide us all. Okay, well, thank you, Ma. The last question here is, um, what would you 
advise a divorce couple? Uh, what, what would you advise a divorce couple who are trying to get back, but one notices that there's a reason change in the other's attitude? It's as if though you are going back to square one or even worse. Mm, do not go forward. <laughs> Hold on tight. Press that brake very, very hard. Do not step forward. Yes, there's familiarity. Um, you already know each other. Somebody say, hey, now it's better the devil I know. I was like, oh, no devil is correct. Please to God, be very, very careful. Or you could go back to where you were. And this time around, it'll be more difficult for you to go out because you wouldn't want to be divorced twice. You will stay and become a manager and you'll be managing each other. You'll become like, like roommates. But at the same time, I ask you, be very prayerful, address your concerns. This is where you have the upper hand because you can talk and say, I'm concerned, I'm seeing this. And don't make the next move till you are satisfied that truly this thing is has stopped. Don't go in marrying a work in progress. Don't go in marrying a potential that you think will become better after marriage. Marriage brings out our true colors. You can't keep pretending for the rest of your life. So you have to make sure you go in you are okay with them as they are now, not as the, you hope them to be, uh, hope they will become. There is no bespoke spouse out there. There's no custom made spouse. You marry them even if they never change again for the rest 